The necessity of restrictive legislation for the protection of employer and employed is manifest under existing industrial conditions. We all agree that it is the duty of the state to protect the weak and those unable to protect themselves. No one objects to the legal restraints on the work of young children. But when it comes to restrictions of a purely sex nature, legislation which regulates the labour of women while it leaves that of men untouched, we need to examine the matter closely in order to find out how far restrictions are beneficial or the reverse. It's frequently stated that the limitation of the hours of women is always followed by the limitation of the hours of men in the same trade. In one instance only has this occurred. When in 1850 Sir George Grey's bill became law, the normal working day for women and young persons in the textile trades was limited to ten and a half hours. Only about one third of the workers were men. It was scarcely possible for any master to keep his mills running after two thirds of the operatives had left. Consequently, the hours of work for the men were limited to those allowed by law for women. Their numerical superiority and the fact that many of the women possessed special skill put them on a level with men. They joined the men's trade union on equal terms. And today in Lancashire, cotton weaving men and women perform the same work at precisely the same rate of pay. But this is a solitary instance. In most industries, men and women do different work, the women taking the lower and less skilled branches and receiving much lower pay even when similar work is done. Legal limitation of women's hours being applied to women only makes them in competition with men less valuable to the employer. We're told, however, that restrictive legislation is beneficial. That we do not doubt at all. It's nice for the overworked toiler to have hours curtailed. Nice! Until the inevitable dock comes of the weekly wage. Until the employer finds it cheaper to engage restricted child labour than to continue to employ restricted women's labour. So, women sink inevitably in the ranks of the unskilled. The painful necessity of eating in order to live obliges them to take any work at any price. They cannot afford to stop to consider whether their competition is lowering the wage of the man who supports a family. Women, already handicapped by social prejudice and lack of training, are further hindered by unequal legislation. Perfect equality before the law is the only just position in which to place grown-up men and women. It's difficult indeed to see upon what ground such equality is denied to men in the case of factory legislation. It's a good thing to work short hours to do away with overtime. Then why not restrict men as well as women? That they are powerless as the women to protect themselves is abundantly evident to all who study the conditions of work in our large cities. 